Good morning. Uh, my name is Paul Ginelli, uh, and we're going to talk about DNA evidence this morning. Um, DNA was first used in criminal cases in 1985. Dr. Alec Jeffries in the UK um, was the person who is uh, credited um, with uh, seeing the use of DNA. It's been used in medical studies, medically, for for years in biology, but he saw it uh, forensic use for DNA. It's, so the next year, it's introduced to the United States, and you know, within uh, four or five years, it spreads throughout the rest of the United States. Um, there were some early cases. Andrew's the first case that is um, a pellet case affirming the admissibility of DNA evidence. Uh, there was no defense expert in that case. So you, see, you see that with scientific evidence until the defense bar gets geared up and understands what the evidence is. Uh, there may be no, be no evidence. But the time we get to Castro in 89, uh, this is Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld's case. Um, they were able to mount a, a substantial attack on DNA evidence, not the science and not its use, but in the way it was being used uh, in that case. You have a, a technology transfer issue. You're taking it from the medical field and you're moving it into forensics and they're not exactly exactly the, the same. Obviously, one of the things is the contamination problems. At crime scenes, you know, they're messy, and you get one chance to do it. Uh, in medical research, you can go back and get a, a clean sample, blood sample, if something is, goes wrong, but not in um, the forensic cases. Uh, there were some early scientific disputes. There were battles between top experts um, in the country um, on DNA evidence. Uh, they were worried about population genetics, uh, and that's really the statistical part of DNA. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, this is what makes DNA so powerful as a evidentiary uh, tool. Uh, and we're going to talk first about nuclear DNA. With nuclear DNA, um, it is in every cell in your body that has a nucleus. Um, and that's most of them. Uh, actually, red blood cells don't have nuclei. But white blood cells do, and the serum that the blood's in, that has uh, cells. So you can get this off not just blood and semen, uh, but you can get it off sweatbands, uh, of hats, or people who wear masks, you know, ski masks for a um, a robbery. Uh, you can get it from uh, saliva. The first uh, World Trade Center bombing in 1993, they took the saliva off the stamp, and that's how they got the, the DNA. Even, you know, dandruff, you're actually shedding your DNA um, in this courtroom, in this uh, boot courtroom <laughs> at the moment. Um, if I put, there's a new thing called touch DNA, so I put my finger down here, I'm leaving my DNA along with my fingerprint. Um, that's what make it, makes it so powerful. Then there's a second type of DNA, it's called mitochondrial DNA. Now mitochondrial DNA, you can use it if you cannot use nuclear DNA. It is not as discriminating, but it's certainly better than what we had before in these areas. So um, hair uh, is shafts of hair. If you get the tag, what they call the tag of the hair, if you get a cell or something at the end of a hair tag, you can use nuclear DNA. But if you can't get that, if it's cut hair or something like that, then you can use mitochondrial DNA, bone without, bones without marrow, um, and so forth. DNA is in everything that lives. So you have these cases, and they're in patent infringement litigation, homicide prosecutions. Uh, they deal with household pets, livestock, wild animals, insects, and so. Uh, this one article talks about how uh, 
one uh, uh, municipality was using it to enforce their pooper scooper law. <laughs> they would go out and pick up the dog feces that were uh, viciously left on somebody's lawn, and they would uh, run a DNA test, track down the dog, give him his Miranda rights, <laughs> and put him away. What did that DNA test cost? Um, back then, it could have been six hundred to a thousand dollars. This is a municipal. <laughs> this is a municipality that has too much money. <laughs> okay, so. Animal, but there are some real cases where animal DNA has been used. Um, Boswell case is, is one of them. And you can see where a, you know, somebody, a murder victim has a cat. And we find cat hairs on a suspect, or dog hairs. Or the suspect has, the, the perpetrator has a, has a dog and has dog hairs and leaves it at the crime of the, the scene of the crime. Uh, even in this case of plant DNA. So, they find these seeds in this guy's truck and they match them to um, seed pods from a Palo Verde tree at the scene of the crime. Um, this is a one on um, uh, HIV virus. All right, so anything that's alive, plants and so forth, has, has DNA in it. All right, so this is my Biology 101 <laughs> slide. Uh, so the DNA is in the chromosomes, in the nucleus of the uh, a cell, and mitochondrial DNA is outside. So mitochondrial DNA is not as discriminating. You get that from your uh, mother's side. So they can trace back. Anybody who's related on your mother's side of the family has the same mitochondrial DNA. Um, with nuclear DNA, we're looking at chromosomes in the nucleus, and you inherit that from both your mother and your, uh, your father. And this is the double, famous double helix. Um, Crick and Watson, I think, with the, in 1953, figured this out. Um, the only thing you have to pay attention here is to the base pairs. Um, that, those are the ladders, uh, or the rungs in this, the DNA ladder. And it's, it's very elegant, it's very simple. It's almost like the original programming of a computer. Um, you got A and T and G and C, and they're always paired with each other's. And that's what they're gonna use. So there's, there's really two steps. First, we have a match, and then we have to interpret that match. So if I use the ABO blood group, I'm, uh, O-type blood, so if we have O-type blood at the scene of the crime, assuming that the victim is a different type, it's not O, uh, then there's a, a match, but you have to understand what the match means. It means, okay, so my blood type matches the crime scene blood type, but we know, interpretation, that 45% of the population has that blood type. If it was AB blood type, 3% of the population has that. Well, we're doing essentially the same steps with uh, DNA. First we have a match, then we have to figure out what the match means by uh, using statistics for population <laughs> genetics, a except that it's far more, far more discriminating. Um, and this is all we're dealing with. This, the current type of DNA that they're using now is called short tandem repeats, and all that means is you look at the DNA sequence, and you see here on the slide with the, the gold, um, you see those base pairs, there's, there's five base pairs we're looking at, and they repeat. And so you, what you're looking for is the number of repeat, the tandem, because they come after us the same. And of course, you want to go to sites, loci, on the, your DNA, uh, chain, so, you know, 99% or 99, more than 99% of humans have the same DNA. So you want to go to something where there's a variability. So, I mean, if you're looking for the physical identification, saying that the defendant or the suspect has a nose, that's not helpful. 
<laughs> but if you say he's got blue eyes, because we know that humans have variations in their eyes or hair or something like that, that's significant. So that's what you want to do. You go to these sites, and traditionally, there's more now, but they, they would look at 13 different sites. Um, and at, at this site, in, in my example, you know, one person could have 19 repeats, another person could have 10, uh, but there are only maybe five, 10 variations at this site, so lots of people will fall into each at one site. And this is an electropharogram. So what you see on the first, this is three different sites. You see if you see on the blue on the top, so that's the designations for three different sites on, on the DNA. And under that, the second um, line, where you see all the peaks, uh, the first peak at the, uh, shows that there are eight variations in the human, for humans, and you see the, the number of repeats, the 12, the 15, the 18, that's what they're telling you, this is repeats and humans are gonna fall into those categories. If we go to the next one, you're gonna see a lot more re variation uh, at that site. And the last site even has more variation. Um, and so the key is that these sites have to be independent. You have to have an independence, you know, the product rule. Um, and the last line on the bottom is a um, example of what one person would show up at each of these sites. And you get one DNA from your, uh, uh, one characteristic allele from your mother and one from your father. And the first one uh, with the 15, um, that means his mother and father had the same 15 at that particular site. Um, and so what we're going to do is if, if there's a match, if there's a, a no match at any of these sites, you just have three of them here, but if you take the first site and the suspect has a, a 15, but the crime scene has a six or a, or a, that's not right, go to a 12. A 12, it's not him, he's out. And so 13 sites, if there's a non-match at any site, there's an elimination. So it's far easier to eliminate people than to include them. Um, all right, so. Professor, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm lost. If you go back to that last slide, where you look at the peaks, that's of what, the United States population? Right. Or the worldwide? Um, well, they, they, they have different databases. There's a, a Caucasian database, there's a Hispanic database, there's a, a black database. Um, you can only use that if you have a, if you know that the assailant is, falls into this category. There's other ways you can, you can um, uh, combine them if you have an unknown. Uh, so these have been, um, I mean, that was the big issue. Have you validated these throughout the United States? Have you validated it throughout the world? And that was the big fight early on in the, in the 90s, and that's over. They've got it. Now, you're going to have problems if you start, you know, have a Navajo Indian. But what, you were, what they were worrying about is sub-categories. So if, if, if we're talking about, you know, people with blue eyes and blonde hair, if you, those are the two characteristics, genet, you know, and you go to Sweden and, <laughs> You know, how discriminating is finding a person with blue eyes and blonde hair. Uh, if we go to sub-Sahara Africa and you have somebody like that, that's, that's significant. So that's what they were worried about. They were worried about populations where they intermarried and you wouldn't get the same kind of distribution, but that issue they've dealt with. Sure. Um, okay, statistics. Don't put your head down, I'm gonna do this fast. Um, so if we get matches at all 13, and we can go up to 16 and more now, but the, take the 13, and they have established that they're independent. So you can use the product rule, and uh, the simple one here, turn over four cards, all are red. 
since there are two colors, you just use the independence by flipping a coin, they're independent. And uh, what are the chances of getting on all four? So if we take these, these are all four sites on the DNA, uh, so it's one in 16. Um, the lottery examples, you get six ping pong balls, one through 10, chance of drawing any number is one in 10. Uh, doing this six times. See, a scientist gave me that, and they put in the parents for attorneys, because you gotta put all the balls back to still get one in 10. Um, so if it's one in 10, you know, it's, there's a million. So what they're doing is taking some common events, but if you take enough of them, you're trying to get a rare event. All right, so DNA, you have these 13 sites on the DNA test, so you take them together. Uh, and the example, let's say uh, we go to, uh, we test these and it's one person in 20, they're simplifying this, but it averages out to that at each, at each site. So one to the 20 to the 30 to the 13th power, uh, as you all know, <laughs> is um, one in 82 quadrillion, um, I've been told. <laughs> Somebody a scientist, not a lawyer. Um, and there's only about 7 billion people in the world. So that's kind of impressive. <laughs> if they've done it right, they didn't have any contamination, if there are no problems, then you have very powerful. And what this is, is they report this as a random match probability. That is, if you went out in a population and you look for these 13 sites with these characteristics, you would find it um, serendipitous, serendipitously one in 82 quadrillion. All right, so that's what DNA is. It says, uh, you know, the last one's like a complete physical description. Height, eye color, hair, gender. Oh, but this is more than that. This is like a mold in the middle of a back. How many people have that, okay? So it, it's just more, far more uh, impressive. The other thing that makes DNA so powerful is co the computer. And the FBI has this established as CODIS, the Combined DNA Index. And so first these databases, first established in Virginia, but then the Federal Act in 1994, each state, like Ohio, each state decides who, who's gonna be in their individual database. Uh, and so in Cuyahoga County, we have the, the medical examiner's office, does a lot of the DNA, and so once a week, they upload that to the state. And once a week, the, F, the state uploads it to the FBI. And once a week, all, the FBI gets all the states and they run the DNA through their, through their uh, computers looking for a match. One of the controversial issue is how, who should be in the database? So it started to be, well, sex offenders uh, because uh, rape cases are uh, one of the most, probably the most uh, common example of, of where you would use uh, DNA. Uh, then they started an experiment with other crimes, some states, uh, and they put all felons. And they were starting to getting hits for people who were forgers. You know, the reason they're in there is they have a, a felony charge for forgery, and all of a sudden, they take uh, DNA from a rape scene and it matched the forger. So they started thinking, well, you know, what, who are we looking for out here? We're looking for career uh, criminals. So there's certain things, voyeurism, that's usually, that can be somebody who's stalking a victim, um, burglary, um, and, and so forth. Other people have, and I'll talk about this, because the Supreme Court upheld putting arrestees in, in databases, um, and so more states will go in that direction. People have argued for a universal, I mean, they, they take uh, blood from every baby, um, looking for, there's a uh, disease 
That is horrific, but you can pick it up at birth by a, a simple blood test, and it's simple to correct if you do that. So every child in this country, they take blood from the child, run the test, but they, you know, they don't keep the, the blood type. Um, this is not going to happen because financially you can't afford um, to do that. Um, so let me give you an example of the, the power of this, this um, the computer searching, because we're looking for cold cases. That is, we don't have a suspect. And so uh, this is Fletcher Worrell. He was linked to um, 25 rapes over a 30 year time span. New York, New Jersey, and in Maryland, he was known as the Silver Springs Rapist. That's a suburb of, of Washington, D.C. Um, and they, they, he was not on their radar. And, these, and they didn't even know they were looking for a serial, a serial uh, rapist. But they put in an old case, um, and they got a hit for all these things, and then they got hit on on Worrell, later he was arrested for something else and they got his, his, uh, his DNA. Uh, and I think it was yesterday, oh, Wednesday, I saw this in the Plain Dealer, uh, first page, funds sought to deal with uh, the DNA back, the backlog. So uh, this is from an earlier Plain Dealer article. Um, they are trying to, testing these, this is a real problem. There are rape kits that have never been tested throughout this country. And so they're trying to test all those uh, rape kits, um, and they're, they're fighting a statute of limitations coming up. But just finding out so far, the time this article was written, uh, they knew they had 12 serial rapists. Same person committing each of these, each of these, uh, each of these crimes. Um, let me go back a minute. The other thing I saw, this was on last week, I guess. Um, sometime this week I saw this. This is this woman in, at the University of Virginia who is uh, missing, Hannah Graham, uh, and they still haven't found her. But they have a suspect uh, from videotape, and they brought him in, and they uh, took his DNA, um, and they say they have hits to two other rape cases in Virginia, one at Charlottesville, the University of Virginia, um, and a couple in uh, Washington, outside the suburbs of Washington, and now they're going back and looking for all rape kits, rapes they hadn't investigated. All right, so you see these types of things in a paper uh, all the time. There are privacy issues. Um, civil liberty issues. Now, um, what you have to understand, what goes into the, the database, it, it has to be converted to uh, computer language. So what they put in, are, it's like a VIN code. They put all these numbers. You got a 15, you got a 14 at the first loci, and, and so forth. So it's, there's nothing there in that number that reveals anything. What they're worried about is insurance companies and other things getting a hold of your DNA and maybe finding you're predisposed to a certain disease and, and so forth. And those are real privacy concerns, but I don't think here they are because they don't put in the sample, they put in a code. Um, they put it in what they call a, they used to call a junk DNA, but um, they're finding out a lot of the junk really isn't junk at all. It, it has a purpose as I do more research, but it's non-coding DNA. It's, it's areas of your DNA where right now we do not know what it does. Um, there are criminal penalties um, for disclosing uh, your DNA um, a code, and it's anonymous. So if the, the FBI gets a hit on an Ohio case, crime scene case, and they get a hit on a code from Virginia, they will notify Ohio, 
and Ohio has to contact Virginia, and Virginia has a separate file with the names that match the code. Okay, so it's another protection. Uh, you can get the code, but you don't know who it is uh, without that. So they, once they get a hit, then they have a good reason to, to search. The real problem is if you retain the blood. If you retain the blood sample, then you could go back and, and, uh, and retest it or test it for other things. So that's really where the uh, disagreement is. And, but most states do keep, uh, keep the blood sample um, on file. <coughs> Supreme Court decided last year, Maryland versus King, and they upheld uh, in a 5-4 decision. Um, and Justice Scalia was in dissent. Uh, he has a very, as you know, a very um, <laughs> I'm trying to, yeah, I am being careful. Uh, he, he has his own view of, of the Constitution, <laughs> this is historical view, and, but if he thinks it's, it's, you're violating it, you're violating So he, he writes good Fourth Amendment cases that actually favor defendants, Sixth Amendment cases favor defendants. So to me, if you teach criminal procedure, um, it's not a surprise that um, he just says this is in his dissent. This is just the first time we're, we're searching without uh, anything. I mean, you, got pro you can get arrested by one police officer without a warrant based upon that police officer's uh, judgment of about whether you have probable cause. All right, and from that, you know, they can't go look in your house based upon that. You need a search warrant or something else. So, I mean, that's, that's the argument, that you haven't been tried, you haven't been arrested. But it's, um, that's the decision. Um, then we have this other interesting problem, it's called familial testing. So I said we're going to look at these 13 loci, and usually when you miss, uh, you run it through, you know, maybe you'll get randomly four or five, you know, at four or five loci, you'll get a matches stuff. But what if you get nine matches? You don't get 13, you get nine, or 10, or 11. Well, that's going to tell you something. It's not the person you're testing, but it, it's probably a relative. It's probably a relative. And so what do you do in those cases? So this is this uh, came out of a 1988 case in the UK. The UK was, is just technologically far more advanced than we are um, in, in this area. Um, so the, the person in there didn't commit the crime. It couldn't be him. He wasn't even born at the time. And I tell my students, that's a good alibi. <laughs> <laughs> so, but they start looking around for his relatives. And they eventually get the DNA uh, from his uncle. And it's a perfect match. Um, they, so then we have this. This is a United States case decided. This came out, a I got it from an article maybe two years ago. L.A., the grim, they call him the grim sleeper. Uh, he stalked people for 25 years. He murdered at least 10, uh, but his DNA was never in the database. Uh, but they get a close match to Christopher Franklin. It's not Christopher Franklin. You can't have a close match. You have to have a perfect match to even take the next step, and that is to work with the statistics. Uh, and he's in there on a weapons conviction. And so they start looking at his family. They narrow the list down. Uh, they see his father discards a slice of pizza. And they go out and they pick it up. All right, so, and it matches. And they've tracked him down. Um, all right, this is another reason that you should finish eating your pizza completely. <laughs> Don't leave it behind. Um, DNA also has had a major impact on exonerations. 
So the Innocence Project, last time I looked, it could be a month ago, they had over 300 exonerations, DNA exonerations. And, you know, 14, 18 of those people were on death row. And the thing about an exoneration, you know, if there's over 330 exonerations, that's 330 injustices and double that. Because that means that the real culprit has not been found and is out there committing probably other, other crimes. So, uh, and, and before we had these acts, the, the called the DNA post-conviction testing, very hard to get DNA testing, only if the prosecutor agreed in the most part. So, I mean, your appeals are gone, your habeas may be gone, um, you know, if it's 10, 20 years later. Some of these cases are 30 years later when they're exonerated. So they, um, last time I, I knew there was about 49 states had these, these exonerations, statutes that allows you to go and, and get tested. And his, I pulled this exap, example out a couple years ago. He's convicted in 1980. Um, and his test, um, they tested, and he's uh, exonerated. 20 years in jail. I just can't imagine it. So 20 years in jail. And he's exonerated. He's just now a growing list of, of these people. DNA is probably the best forensic science now. It's, it's scientifically based, uh, far more than fingerprints which really have not been validated scientifically, um, but it's not perfect, and so there are problems. So the, Jacqueline Blake, she didn't, FBI um, analyst, didn't do the negative controls. That's testing for contamination for two years. Um, it's a lot easier for, to do your job in a lab if you don't do any testing. Um, she figured that out, but she did it for, so I had to go back and, and, and retest these cases. Um, she wasn't doing the examination, she was doing the pre-examination um, contamination. So a lot of these cases, there was no contamination anyway, we just didn't test for it, um, but they had to go back. Houston is just a disaster, the Houston Crime Laboratory. So you see this editorial by a state representative, the validity of almost any case that's relied upon evidence produced by this lab is questionable, including DNA. So look at this, they had almost 20,000 sexual assault kits backlogged. If you see that, that's why you see this thing in the, um, in the paper, that means that there are women getting raped and we could have prevented those rapes. If we had put those back, all those in the backlog, we, on some of those cases, we would have gotten hits. And if you haven't gotten hits on the actual person right away, sometimes you just leave it there, it's in the forensic file, this guy gets arrested, two, three years later, gets his DNA, we get the hit. Or we get the hit and now nobody in the file, but we know that this, there's 10 rapes with the same guy. And that's a, so we know we're looking for a serial killer. And that's a very different, that's a, a huge help for the police to do that. Um, then the other thing about it is, uh, you see Lynn Jones, he's arrested for sexual assault of a child. He's in jail for nine months before they finally do his DNA and release him. He's exonerated. Um, then they had this other thing. They had, a, they had a leaky roof with 34 homicide and sexual assault cases. And it's just, it's not hidden, it's there. You go into work, <laughs> cut a cup of coffee, walk by the leaky roof, nothing happens. They report it and the Internal Affairs finds it, doesn't do anything about it. Um, they convicted jo Josiah Sutton with bogus DNA. Uh, they didn't know what they were doing, didn't have the right statistics. Um, the statistic that was supposed to be so uh, convincing in his case, um, every black 
American has, one in, one in eight black Americans have that characteristic and they just put it in the wrong thing, so they got one of these one in a billion, one in a million thing. Um, DNA can be contaminated. You know, I say, okay, I put my finger here, you put your finger on top of it, now we have contamination, we have two people, um, you know, with the, with the DNA. Uh, one of the problems is statute of limitations. Um, Ohio had changed because of the child abuse, sexual abuse cases. It changed its rape statute, uh, I don't know, in the last decade to 20 years. It used to be six. Uh, and other states don't have that. They still have the six years. So the argument, the argument for statute of limitations, it's not a constitutional right. Okay, it's all statutory, is that the evidence is going to get stale. And the argument is with DNA evidence, it doesn't get stale. If you do it right, you keep it, and it is still good. Yeah, I mean, it still, you know, has an impact on a defendant, because if you have an alibi, you can't remember where you were 20 years ago. Um, so, but it doesn't have the, you don't have bad memories and, you know, people, witnesses dying and, and so forth. Uh, and so what they've done, and that's what, they're doing in, in Cuyahoga County, they, they are using what they call John Doe indictments. And John Doe indictments have been around a long time. They don't know the name of the person, but you put in his description, so and so. Well, now they're putting in his DNA code, indicting him by the DNA code, uh, and some jurisdictions have uh, permitted that. Um, there's all sorts of search and seizure issues here. One is these dragnets. Um, and these dragnets where you, st that's, it was actually the first DNA case in England had this thing. Now, they had two cases, uh, rapes of, uh, rape murders of teenage girls three years apart. So they said, this is probably the same guy. They arrest a, this guy's a janitor, he has a low IQ. Apparently, he confesses to one. He refuses to confess to the other crime. Um, and so they send it to Dr. Jeffries to do his DNA test, and he comes back and says, okay, the good news is you're right. The same guy committed both rapes. The bad news, it's not the guy you arrested. <laughs> and so what they do is, these are small communities. They ask voluntarily for people to come in and give their DNA, to give their DNA uh, voluntarily. And then the guy who, and thousands of men come in and do it. Uh, and the one guy, Colin Pitfork, the actual perpetrator, uh, he gets a buddy, pays a buddy to go in for him. Um, the buddy's not the smartest guy in the world, and he starts telling people how he went in for Colin. Um, and so eventually the police found out and they made it. So um, the problem with these is very controversial. Uh, one college community, you know, the suspect perpetrator, they knew, all they knew was he was a young black male. And so they started asking for all young black males to come in. There's a racial problem here immediately. Um, and none of these have really been very successful. There was a case in Massachusetts where they were doing this on Cape Cod. Uh, a woman was murdered in her house. Um, and after a while they couldn't solve this, so they start asking people to come in. And there are all sorts of civil libertarians. This isn't just not a not just liberals, but it's libertarians who don't think the government has a right to ask them or put pressure on them. Um, it's evasion of their privacy to give, to give uh, blood. So, I mean, that, that's the issue. Um, and they eventually find the person, but not through the dragnet. They find the person because he was a garbage collector. And the first thing they did is they went around and asked anybody who had access to the house to give a DNA sample, and he did. Um, but it was in their lab the whole time. So they're spending all this money on a dragnet when 
if they had just processed this guy's DNA soon enough, it would have been, okay? It could work, I think, in a, in a place like this, if there's a murder here in this room, and one of us did it, you know, if, it's, if you have a closed situation. Sometimes you have these at hospitals or mental institutions, some woman is raped, uh, and you have a small, you know, it's gotta be a staff member or somebody had access, then you might go around and it might be successful, but otherwise these things haven't been. The other thing is the abandoned samples. So, uh, you know, you pick up the pizza, or you see on the TV, you pick up the coffee cup, or you pick up anything that somebody drops, throws away in their trash. Um, and there's a Supreme Court case, a trash case, actual trash case, <laughs> where they go through the garbage, and the Supreme Court says you abandon it, you have no expectation of privacy, you put it out in the trash, and that's over. The problem with the DNA is, it's not voluntary. You are giving up your DNA just by sitting here, um, but all the courts have allowed that. All right, they just call that it, it's abandoned. Uh, okay, now this tells me that I have finished the slides. <laughs> In academia, that's called a clue. <laughs> All right, but uh, we have time, and they wanted, uh, so I was going to let you ask questions. Yes? So, if you call the rape kits, uh, who processes them? How long does it take, and how much does it cost? And, uh, Okay, so I'll tell you the best I can. Um, there are nurses, they call them sane nurses, sexual assault nurses, um, and they're trained to do exactly what you'd think. In sexual assault cases in the emergency room, and there is a rape kit. Um, and it's very intrusive for a victim. So they're going to automatically I mean, you get one shot, okay? So they don't want the victim to, you know, many rape victims will go home and take a shower. They feel dirty, they want to take a shower, well, you just washed away a lot of evidence. So what they want on the rape kit is they're gonna ask the victim if she's willing to give, um, they need her DNA, so they'll take a, a buckle slide, a cheek swab, that's not the problem, but they'll take a vaginal smear They'll comb uh, uh, her uh, vaginal hair, the victim's vaginal um, hair, um, to look for samples of the, the perpetrator's hair. Uh, they want all the clothes. Um, they'll look under her fingernails to see if she scratched somebody and stuff. Um, so, you know, that's a, basically rape people. One of the problems is there's not enough nurses who are trained to do that, and especially in, in smaller hospitals around the country. Uh, they have them here in Cleveland. Um, and so that's important. Um, that's why I get so angry when I find out you put these victims through this stuff, which is very intrusive, at a time when they're under tremendous stress, and then you let it sit in a police department for 20 years and you didn't do anything with it. Well, you throw it out without testing it. it that's the crime, that's the second crime. Um, so then they, they get the evidence and they will put it in, you know, if they have a suspect or she can identify somebody and have a suspect, then um, you can either get probable cause to get a, an arrest warrant or a search warrant for the blood um, or you can trail a person and try to get the abandoned sample or whatever. Um, but if you have, it's a cold case and you have nothing, then you, you can upload the DNA into the, to, to the database. I don't know, it's, it's becoming faster and faster to do in the DNA test now, but I don't know the answer to that. It's, it's not overnight. It's not like uh, CSI, okay, you know. <laughs> Look at it, stick it in the machine, the next commercial break, we get the answer. 
Um, so we're talking about days. They can put a full court press on if they have to, but it takes certain time to do the process. Uh, and there's a backlog. So that's a problem. The prices come down. I, I don't know, last time I heard something, you could do it for $600. They farm out the, the, the prisoner convict cases to private firms um, to speed up it. But that's easy to tell. It's not a crime scene. You know, you, you go to somebody, you take a buccal swab, buckle swab, that's it. So it's a clean swab, it's, it's not the same thing. At the crime scene, you have to be worried. Especially in a rape case, you get a, uh, a vaginal smear, uh, you're gonna get not just the, the semen, um, you're gonna get the, the woman's epithelial cells, skin cells. Um, and then you have to separate those which they can do, but these are mixtures, they call them. It's more difficult when you're dealing with mixtures. I don't know if you remember the Duke lacrosse rape case, uh, where they finally used the new process and they did the vaginal, it wasn't any of the Duke players. Okay, we excluded them, but this woman had had sex with six other people who were not her boyfriend or anybody she admitted to having sex with, but they, they found that. So um, now that's easy because that's an exclusion. We know it was not these, the, the lacrosse team, and we also know that it contradicted her, her story, that it was a, a gang rape uh, uh, that happened very soon, okay? And uh, it contradicted that. Other questions? You know, I don't get my million dollar honorarium if I don't go to the, <laughs> the end of the hour here. More important, you may not get your CLE credit. Yes, yes. We're webcasting, so it's got to be heard. Okay. Uh, do you think it's a legitimate police technique when investigating a crime to uh, rummage through somebody's trash in search of DNA? Do you think it's a legitimate police technique when investigating a crime to set up an interview with a suspect solely for purposes of getting DNA off the person's clothing or hair? I have, I have, um, yeah, no, I have problems um, uh, with that. Um, and the counter argument, the prosecutors, I mean, the problem is that DNA is different than trash, I think. So even if, you know, I argued that the Supreme Court, I, I always thought the Supreme Court case was wrong. Yeah, you throw your trash away, but you don't expect people to go through it. And, you know, what are you going to do to protect you? Burn your own trash, or everyone has a compactor, or, you know. So, I disagreed with that. And what of us lucky people in Shaker Heights? Well, we don't put our trash on the lawn. We hide it next to our garages. So, I had a problem with the trash case, because I, um, but I can distinguish that from the DNA because you have no choice. It's not like you're throwing out, you know, you could if you wanted to watch what you threw out. I mean, your trash has, think about the trash. Every medicine you take, you throw out the medicine, you know, your whole medical history is in your trash. If you've taken medicines, and it gets to be my age, that's all you do is take medicines. <laughs> so, you know, what magazines you, you get? liberal magazines or do you get conservative magazines or you get you know i don't think the government has a right to do that uh, unless they have probable cause or at least reasonable suspicion so that's where i'm coming from to give you the the, the argument that the prosecutor would would give um or the police officer said we could interview you and get your fingerprints <laughs> that glass that we give you that we're going to get your dna we're getting your fingerprints at the same time, and you know your fingerprints are then exposed, and we can use that as as well. So I don't think it's an easy issue. I'm very disturbed that they went to the upheld the the arrestees. Um, I um, I was on I was on the reporter for the ABA's DNA task force uh, DNA standards. And we argued about these things, the defense counsel, the prosecutors, um, and we couldn't agree. Um, but they came out with 
if you're going to do this, then you needed more than the arrest of one police officer. You needed to get a judicial probable cause determination. So um, you can get the DNA, but uh, the, this person's arrested. You, you know, you have to get at least probable cause that he's arrested for something that um, that's valid. Um, so we, that was sort of the compromise. He wanted at least a judicial finding at, at a certain stage. And if you're arrested, they're supposed to do a judicial finding within 48 hours. Uh, but then the police can get around that by looking for the abandoned sample. So, yes? Uh, if you mentioned about, you mentioned about the um, exonerations. I know this may be difficult, but can you give us an example of a case where a person went to trial, let's say it was a jury trial, was convicted, sentenced, and then later exonerated, and how that happened? Um, well, there's a case, actually, um, Ron Williamson, was uh, five days from execution when a uh, federal judge issued a habeas um, stating the execution. Um, if you want to read, this is, I, I picked him because he's only five days away. Um, but John Grisham has written a nonfiction book on this trial. Uh, and it's, it, you know, it's a good read, because he's a good writer. So it's one of his nonfiction books, the Williamson case. Um, and in these exoneration cases, you, this is what you see. You see uh, you have a jailhouse snitch who gives his name. And, and jailhouse snitches, they have nothing to lose. I mean, don't ever trust them. Um, it's funny because it's unusual because it's a female jailhouse snitch and they don't, they're not in the same cells. So her contact with him wasn't much, she could talk to him. And so here's a guy who's pleaded innocent for years who decides to confess to a woman he doesn't know in jail. Um, and then they have hair evidence. Before mitochondrial DNA, I mean, hair was just misused badly at trial. Um, this snitch, the year before, was a sn in jail and snitched on a d different murder case. So this is Ada, Oklahoma. I don't know. They don't have that many murder cases, but the same <laughs> snitch solved two of them in two years. Um, and she, she didn't mention the second one for a year later when she got rearrested. So, um, you know, that's, that's one case. Earl Washington was nine days from execution in Virginia. It's a book, very, Margaret Eds, E-D-D-S, on, um, on his case, uh, it stops at a certain point, she's a reporter. Um, uh, so, he has a low uh, IQ, and they got a false confession from him. Um, I was always surprised in the exoneration cases, that, you know, 20% of false confessions. I just didn't believe, I mean, that's counterintuitive. But most of the false confession cases are juveniles or people with low, low IQs, and Earl was, you know, they would tell him they essentially fed him the information that only the, the victim could possibly, I mean, the perpetrator could possibly know about a blanket and stuff like that, but he didn't know any about that. So um, that was a long case. They finally stayed the execution <coughs> based on DNA evidence, um, but they commute, commuted his sentence. <laughs> they should have exonerated him, but they commuted his sentence, so he served another nine years or whatever it was. 
uh, before it came out and they found out and they won this big civil suit and the, uh, there was suppression of evidence that would have exonerated him at trial um, and the police officer detective uh, admitted that he had fed the information to Washington. If, you, if you're interested in the subject, you can go on the, uh, just put innocenceproject.org, you'll pull up and they, they have all the cases. They have all the cases and you can go through them and they have it all by, you know, false confession cases, forensic science cases, um, jailhouse snitch cases. The big one is lineups, okay? Um, where you have misidentifications. So, yes? Along those lines, there's also a performance piece called The Exonerated, and um, somebody, I don't remember who, put together um, testimonial, uh, uh, pieces of testimony as well as correspondence from convicted individuals um, who ended up being exonerated, and the tragedy is for this piece, um, they've memorialized the correspondence of people who were executed and exonerated after they were after their execution. Oh, see, they've been looking for a case for an exoneration after execution for a while. So I, I, I know that play, and I know that I've read a couple commentaries. Prosecutors attacking the 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 basis the factual basis but I don't know enough about that um, Virginia had a case I think it was the Odell case um, with the, his parents where somebody wanted to test the DNA after the guy was executed and the Virginia Supreme Court refused they said they don't have that authority there was a case in Virginia um, Ronald Coleman case it was, it was a famous case because the appellate attorney was one day late on the appeal, and the U.S. Supreme Court said, too bad. Um, and so for years, they were trying to get it tested, and you know the governors wouldn't test it for years and years. And then Mark Warner, the present senator, said, OK, let's find out. So they tested it. It was actually guilty. They fooled everybody. Um, I did ask uh, Peter Neufeld, Barry Sheck, I said, how many of your cases will you submit the DNA that, that has come back that confirms the conviction instead of exonerates? And I don't know, they gave me a figure that's 40, 45% of the cases. And I said, what the hell are these people doing? They're just trying to game the system, trying to, to get nothing else to do, so maybe they'll get a lucky break. Uh, and I said, what it is, is it's the family. They've been telling the family they're innocent, and it's the family pressuring uh, the Innocence Project to run the test and everything. So um, they just, you know, they wouldn't own up to their own family, and they get tested, and it's and it's confirmed. Um, that's a problem. Just doing retesting DNA statues. One, the only thing that really gives me pause on those, not enough to stop it is that you know with the victim impact victims rights statute you got to go back to the rape victim and tell her many times that we're going to retest this you have to have somebody who's finally moved on in their life the last time they want thing they want to hear is this might get opened up again um so i think that's a that's a concern in these cases but on the other hand if somebody's serving a sentence um for something they didn't do, and these are all big cases. These are, <laughs> these are going to be rape, murder cases. Uh, you can get, you know, used for robberies and stuff, because people leave DNA at banks and stuff, but most of the cases. Now, what's going to happen now, at certain point, these cases, prisoners will die, but at certain point, let's say it's 1995 or 96, prosecutors are now using DNA right away. So what you get, if you're going to get exonerations, you, you get them early before anybody's charged. Prosecutors has a suspect, they run the DNA, he's not it. All right, so over time, these are going to, you know, peter out um, for the most part because, because the prosecutors, are not, you know, know it's such a powerful tool. Um, okay, are there any other 
questions, I will be happy to stay here and talk to anybody um, after the session's over. So do I say goodbye, world? <laughs> <laughs>